Okay, well, I, I hope everybody can um, hear me. I have no I real idea whether you can or not, but there we go. So anyway, I'll start off by, by saying this is um, very much a, a production of a lot of people. Only some of them are listed there, um, both from two labs, the, the, the Tromso lab um, and the research centre here, uh, where I am at the moment, uh, and then also the Southampton lab. So that's why, and I will try to 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 put pictures up of various people as we go through who've really been responsible for doing this so it, it's certainly not putting it either or me anyway um i'll just start with this because this is one of my heroes this man called william Bateson, and and he actually is the man who who um first uh, used the word gene uh for a unit of hereditary um, but what I like is his quote, treasure your exceptions. And uh, I'll come back to that and why I like it um, later on, possibly, uh, well, not possibly, but I will come back to it later on in the talk. Um, I thought I would try to give a broad view of what we're doing in of DNA at the moment in relation to human impact. So I'll say a little bit about taphonomy. Um, then I'll look at lakes and human impact, which is where we started and where still our majority of our work is. Uh, floodplains, which I'm very interested in, uh, uh, for an uh, earlier career, my work was largely on floodplains, uh, and then terraces, agricultural terraces, which we had a big project on. And then I'll look at, at, at how we might move towards unifying some of these different parts of the environment. It's worth remembering that Sedan DNA has only been around for 20 years. Um, this is the first paper that had extracellular DNA as opposed to intracellular DNA, DNA. So, and there were only two two um, samples from the Holocene in it. So, it, it is a, a quite a, a young field. Now, you all know how to sample, but these are just the. We do try to take rather better sampling procedures for DNA than perhaps we would have done in the past for pollen, but I, it fundamentally isn't that different. Then we extract about um, generally a very small amount of sediment, about 0.2 grams or, or, or even less we can do. Uh, but there are some protocols which use more uh, in, in a clean lab, of course. Uh, and then there are basically three kinds of method methodologies. Uh, there's capture probes, which target a few species, which I won't talk about at all. Then there's metabarcoding, which is what which targets organism groups, which I will talk about almost uh, largely. And then I'll talk a little bit about use some shotgun sequencing, which is non-targeted. And we have a very um, uh, conservative bioinformatics approach, so we're more likely to lose real uh, what we might call um, uh, positives. We're a little more likely to actually um, lose taxa than we are to gain because we're trying to avoid particularly having false positives uh, and for the metabar coding we use the uh, the trnl p6 loop with chloroplast with eight replicates and then for the animals we use 12s and 16s um, mitochondrial dna and four replicates so that that's that's really the the methodology that that we use um, now obviously we we we're very interested in in trying to understand the taphonomy of uh, of set of DNA uh, because that controls really its potential and how we can interpret the results. We know some things. We know that it's adsorbed onto mineral surfaces, especially calcites um, and also clay minerals um, via cation bridging. And there's actually some pictures here. Um, the the, the grey, I think this works. These are actually fantastic images of, of strands of DNA um, using AFM uh, on, on mica, I think that is. Um, we also know it's absorbed onto bone, and we also uh, um, we know that it's adsorbed onto charcoal and soot. And we can see that these different down here, I've got a diagram which shows that the, the animals are probably coming largely from the calcite, uh, from the appetites here, and the plants are probably largely coming from the clays. That's from some work that we've done a couple of years ago. But taphonomy has two parts, and the other part is where does it come from? And here um, we've got a, a student called uh, Tuluk Ataman has been doing a very nice uh, study where she's got a small catchment up here near the fringe ed edges of agriculture, but half her catchment is agricultural, the top part, and then the rest you can see around here is all natural uh, or mostly natural boreal forest. And the good news is 
uh, that uh, if the optimum place to put your, if you have to take one core, your optimum place is pretty well in the lowest, the depot center. So that's where the highest richness, richness is. This lake has two depot centers. So we've got one up at the north end here and we've got one down there as well. So if you want to maximize your chance of getting as many type species as possible, you put your cores there. So that's good news. The other sort of good news is that there is a pattern here though. And um, if you look at this diagram here, I'm not sure whether you can actually see my cursor, but if you look at the one with the green spots all over it round the, round the lake, you'll see that that's, bir that's birch and it, it's everywhere in the catchment and it's in every sample of the lake, no problem. If you then move to the one which is the yellow spots, well, that's uh, Angelica, wild Angelica. That's really associated with agriculture in this in this environment, and you can see it's in one area to the to the north of the lake, and then also a little bit to the south. And the 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 actual distribution in the lake sort of mirrors that. And we're doing more work on the statistics of that, but basically, the optimum is centre of the lake, and where there is a bias towards the areas which are close to the lake, as you, you might really expect, but it's also affected by the incoming stream network. So that's where it does come from, the catchment, and this is where it doesn't come from, and this is largely to forestall questions about could DNA come from pollen. This is a really nice study done by Per Shogren of this lab actually some years ago, and um, it's two lakes in Scotland, uh, they both were forested in the 1960s. And if we look at the records, we can see that, for example, pine pollen, well, there's a bit, there is a significant bit before afforestation, but there's very little DNA before afforestation. And if we look at larynx, well, we don't get, uh, we don't get uh, pollen of larynx much because it's very large and it's, it's a, a very low producer, but we do get the DNA. So I think this shows basically this is just an illustration, quite a handy one, um, of why the, the DNA doesn't come from pollen. There's basically too low a biomass in pollen. The spore, the, the, the coat, the spore of pollen in requires exine disruption, which we don't do during extraction. And also there's very little chloroplast DNA in pollen. So for all those reasons, uh, we basically don't think it comes from, it doesn't come from pollen. Now, I want to talk about three lakes of different degrees of human impact, one in the north with very little, and then two from, uh, one from Scotland and one from Ireland that have different sort of types of, of human impacts over different periods. Northern Norway, which is where we started, a lot of this work started, this is a really nice um, isolation basin. If you look on the right, you can see that we've got uh, a changing environment from a marine through to uh, a uh, an early Holocene uh, freshwater environment and then how the ecosystem develops into the middle Holocene. And so we've got 177 plants, but the most more interesting is, is are the animals here. And you can see that the, the marine here uh, in the Younger Dryas, all concentrated in the Younger Dryas. Then we get into the, uh, the, uh, the sort of coastal and here we have all the uh, all the terrestrial um, mammals um, and birds as well. Um, and there is human impact here. If you look at the reindeer, you'll see it's, it's sort of spotty. And then there's continuous for those last three samples, the last 500 years are missing. But the last thousand years, it looks like there's a much stronger representation of reindeer. But also, um, this is quite a nice, uh, quite a nice test because Next or near to this uh, lake are um, a very long-lived archaeological site, the largest in northern Norway, in fact, um, and it has houses, and those houses had bones recovered from them, and so we can see the different spectra here. And if we look, for example, at beaver, beaver appears in the lake 5,700 years ago, uh, and it is in the excavated house that is dated to between 7,600 and 5,500. So they fit together. So that's very nice. And we know from other sites now that beaver was right across the whole of northern um, Scandinavia um, during the early to middle Holocene and, and only really died out in the last 3,000 years due to human impact. Right. So that's that's got discernible human impact but low this is uh lot catherine it has much higher human impact uh this has been caused by so many people um uh, it's not true um uh, uh, and 
what we had to do though was to re uh, redo the archaeology because the archaeology had a lot of it wasn't published so we've got two major archaeological sites around the lake this Rath at the top and this Island McHugh in the sort of in this basin here um, and so that uh, meant that we had to basically go through all the archaeological records reassemble and collate material uh, and so then we end up with a, 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 re a reasonably good archaeological record uh, from the Neolithic through to the post -med medieval which covers both sites as well and any other and a few other sites that there are within the quite small catchment. So we have, we've actually had to improve the archeological uh, record to be able to do this work, to make sense of the results from the DNA. And so we've got 300 vascular plants. Um, this is just a selection of them. And we've got um, periods of site for, uh, construction here. That's on Island McHugh from the titanium record. Uh, but then you can see we've got forest clearance, largely shown by the fact that the open uh, ground, open species appear. We have cultivation, which is um, um, oats and uh, flax and uh, barley. Uh, we have also a really clear record of the exotics. Ireland is very good because, useful because, it, it doesn't have so many species. Um, and we know the history of, of the introductions of these species. So that's very useful and a bit of eutrophication even in the plants as well. But things get more interesting when you add on the, the animals. So we've got this early period here, which is Bronze Age of domesticates, mostly cattle and also some pig. And then we've got this later period, which is Iron Age through to early medieval. Um, uh, which uh, has uh, not only the domesticates, but also deer as well, um, uh, within coming from the, the site. We've uh, also done some authentication. Now, we, uh, we don't normally authenticate um, the record from lakes because they are vertically stratified and um, therefore uh, we don't get movement of DNA within the, the lake column. Uh, but for archaeological sites, we, we, we sometimes do have to authenticate. And there are two ways of doing it. Now, one is this is extrinsic. So here we've got a record from the Tower House of the 15th and 16th century of, of horses being stabled on the Tower House, which is there. And you can see that the only time, like the only two samples that have horse in it are correspond to this period. Uh, nothing before. So that's a little bit of confidence. We also have the introduction of seeker deer um, into this uh, into this landscape, um, and um, if you take the raw age depth model, you get an introduction date of 1760, which is too early. But the other thing we have, which appears in the same samples, is this unpleasant tubificid worm, Limnodrillus of Meisteri, at very high reeds, as you can see here, and. Um, this therefore means that there's bioturbation of these upper sediments. So if you use a bit of a, if you use a, a small uh, mixing model, you can recalculate the likely date of, of seeker introduction. And it comes out then to be about 1860 to, to um, 1870, sorry, 1840 it comes out to be. And we know that the introduction is 1860, between 1860 and 1870. So we're still a bit early, but it, it's, it's, pretty pretty close. So uh, this therefore shows how important the age depth model is and how much tubificate worm worms can cause a problem. The other way of authenticating is using intrinsic authentication, which is damage patterns. And to do this, you have to use shotgun sequencing. And this has been done by, by the Globe people at Michael, Michael Winter Pedersen. And you can see here, we've got the age depth model with its characteristic um, increase in, in uh, uh, the accumulation rate in the last 3,000 years, which is known from the site. But you can see that the, the distribution of the damage uh, varies from almost, almost uh, a very low at the top to about 0.3 mean at the, at the base. And you can see it's nicely distributed. This basically is the aging of, of, of DNA in situ. Uh, you can see um, that it doesn't work very well for the animals. And the reason for that is that there are much lower reads in shotgun sequencing of the animals. And I'll come back to this and I'll explain a bit more about, about um, damage pattern analysis um, uh, just a little bit later on. 
We've also um, looked at um, fecal stanols in this site um, um, uh, because people said, well, the DNA could be from things that are long dead. And obviously, um, therefore, what do the fecal stanols say? And this is work done by Helen Mackay and the occupancy modeling is done by Francesco Ficitola. And you can basically see that we've got a record here of the, the those are our, so our DNA. And you can see this very high point here, probably either pig or human. Um, here in the uh, later Bronze Age. So we have this peak at, that's the, the peak. And then we have also quite high values through into the medieval period. And interestingly, if you then look at um, the gut bacteria that you can also get from, um, from shotgun sequencing, you can see that there's some correspondence, not entirely, but the highest levels of gut bacteria coincide pretty well with this period in the late Bronze Age. And these are not, um, these, these are typically associated with humans, but they, they actually can be associated with other species, of course, as well, but they are particularly associated with humans. Uh, so um, this is we this is something we've only just started doing is actually starting to mine the data for looking at um, things like gut bacteria. Um, but I think it's very exciting that you can potentially do this. And then basically we can put this together and we've done some modeling at this site, which I'm not gonna talk about. And so we know that actually temperature and the water table do actually drive some elements of the lake ecology, particularly the biogenic silica. Um, but otherwise it's, it's a human impact record. And particularly it's a cultural record of a farmstead, a Cranach, uh, which is probably a royal early medieval Cranach, uh, a, a castle, a mansion, etc. So. That's very strong human impact, which fundamentally is driving the 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 lake ecosystem through changes to vegetation and uh, grazing animals. I want to talk uh, briefly about an another lake, uh, which where there's a rather more subtle um, uh, uh, but more particular effect, and this is the Sea of Moyle project, which we've just finished really. And there were six islands, and I'm just going to mention a little bit about uh, the site on on Isle. Um, and uh, particularly it's the site of Finlagen, which is very famous because it was a Viking settlement where it was a um, Del Rider settlement before that, and then Viking and then a medieval palace. It was the palace of the Lord of the Isles. So it's got a very strong archeological record and it's been excavated over, over many years. And here is the uh, 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 selected uh, DNA, just like a pollen diagram, just as bad really, Not, um, and they can be worse. Um, but we can see here that we've got medieval cultivation, we've got abandonment phase. We then have the beginning of uh, potatoes, and then potatoes come through and they stop pretty suddenly, which would be around 1850, of course, the potato famine. And then we have a nice representation here of the forestation, which we know from around the site from the 1980s. So we have a complete record of, of through the potato period and the Great Famine and very high medieval Hiberno-Norse palace agriculture, which is when the palace was operating at its, its full extent. But we have animals, of course. Um, we can see that we have a lot of cattle, uh, we have sheep, we have uh, uh, pig. Uh, uh, red deer is reintroduced in the 1800s and that comes out. And we even have a geese peak and I was a bit worried about the geese um, peak. Um, uh, uh, but if you actually look at a contemporary illustration from the Great Famine, it is interesting that there's a pig in the background and there's a goose. Uh, it does seem to be the case that although this was the period of the leading up to and around about the famine, there, there still were these animals uh, in the landscape. Lastly, you'll also notice that we've got some problems of chronology at the top, and that's again because of the appearance of, in this case, tubifex tubifex, which is the major um, um, tubificate worm, which causes problems. So... And um, putting this together, in fact, uh, with the other the other um, islands, um, it's interesting that out of our range of islands, the two which suffer the least population decline are is the the, the richest, which is uh, which is effectively um, Isle, is the richest island, the most fertile, and the other one is the least fertile, which is Torrey Island, um, and we think it's from completely different reasons. We think it's because Torrey Island is not is very rarely is not affected by 
uh, potato blight because it's so stuck out in the western, out from the northwest of Donegal. And um, Isla, interestingly enough, had something else to turn to. Um, so as as basically potato drops out and becomes uh, and is replaced, it's replaced by barley. And of course, we all know what you can make out of barley. And of course, this is actually the acceleration of the number of distilleries that there are in Isla. So, um, well, yeah, that's one of the reasons that the population of Isla didn't crash as much. There was emigration, of course, but it didn't crash as much as, as the islands, we think so. Right. I want to talk about one paleo channel. Um, we've gone, done a fair number of fluvial sites now, but they do present rather different problems. Um, and so that's why uh, I'll, I'll just pick one, really. This is a site from um, from Suffolk, and it's a very useful archaeological site, a very interesting archaeological site, because it is one of the very few sites, it's Neolithic, that has uh, these frontlets. They're only known from three sites in the world. Uh, well, certainly in Europe. I don't know about elsewhere. Um, uh, one is Starkar, of course, Mesolithic, and another one is in Germany, which is also Mesolithic. But this is the other one, and this is Neolithic. But with strong Mesolithic affinities, because there's a horn core of, a, of an aurochs, and that, when it was dated, turns out to be Mesolithic, although it's in a Neolithic context. Right, so it's a very interesting site. And this is Sam Hudson, who's done this work um, for his PhD. And here is our selected species. Um, it's a fully forested environment. You all that brown, those little brown is the trees. Uh, but we also have here um, an elm decline. And this is actually the first set of DNA elm decline, um, uh, we think. Um, so uh, we're, we're perhaps reinventing the palynology wheel, but <laughs> it is quite interesting to see it here. Um, and then we also have uh, domesticates. Now that was, we were hoping for aurochs, of course, but we don't have aurochs. We have domesticated cow, sheep, and, uh, and even a bit of pig. Now what's happening here? So this is where we need authentication. So, and I mentioned that uh, damage pattern is the way to, to authenticate or one of the ways to authenticate. So that's the change from C to T, from cytosine to thymine at the ends of the DNA strands. And so you can see here, the green C goes down and T goes up. Yep. Okay. And then if you look at therefore here with distance from the end, you can see that there's the T going up. There's the T. And that's for hazel. And that is for, um, that's for cow. Uh, so domesticated cow, um, suggesting that it is old. Um, now you can see that this is smooth and that's rough. And this again is due to the number of reads. The more reads you have, the, the smoother it will be. So that is our authentication of this. And we think that basically cattle, uh, it was used as a crossing point and that cattle and other domestics were brought down, uh, cattle particularly to drink, and then were moved across. And uh, one interpretation of the site is that it's actually uh, a trackway across this, this, uh, this, this peat filled, muddy, um, partly water filled and um, cut off channel. Right, so I want to, to, to move on then to talk about terraces. Now, uh, terraces are um, agricultural terraces, which is a, another project which is just, just in it, hasn't quite finished, but it's nearly finished, um, um, have always been a problem. Um, and um, we put together here dating new OSL, particularly dating methods with, uh, with biological methods to try to understand more about the history of terraces. And we have 12 sites that yielded DNA across Europe there here. And DNA was actually a backup method. The first method we wanted to use was phytoliths, and we did use phytoliths, but the DNA turned out to be rather more interesting than, than I had really thought it would do. These are the plant sequences, uh, uh, so taxa. 140 down to here, Castro and the Sicily, 216. And we expected it to be high in the north and low in the south uh, because of the preservation of DNA. And some of the southern ones are low. You can see Tinos and East Crete there are very low indeed. But basically, that is not a latitudinal pattern. Uh, that's plants with animals it's not uh, we didn't get so the results aren't anywhere near so good in general about um, four to six and often less than that so uh, however they do make sense some of the things that we see in the north are things that should be in the north and some of the things we see in the south are things that should be in the south um, so but we'll, we'll mention that as we go along 
interestingly enough, there's virtually no relationship or really with a number of samples. So the number of taxa should obviously be related to the number of samples following a sort of curve. And you really don't get that. Um, and then also the number of taxa against mean annual temperature. Well, um, you could argue it should increase because of biodiversity increasing, but it doesn't. And also you can see here a real clear um, uh, standing out of, of Castronovo. Um, so I'm actually only going to talk about two, uh, two uh, talk about two of these sites. I'll talk about Björnshin and Castronovo. Um, the most northerly and, and one of the most southerly. This is the most northerly site on Nandoya, sort of towards the edges of, of agriculture, really, but it's a south facing slope. Um, and here's our transect. We've got a terrace here, a cultivated area, uncultivated area, another terrace here, cultivation, and then more cultivation up there. And the old church and the settlement used to be where those, those trees are. And what's interesting is that you can see even in the soils that the cultivated, very clear, deep, uh, these, um, uh, sandy, silty soils, um, uh, brown earths, and then you can see the areas that were not cultivated actually have podzolic soils. And 134 sequences, we're not going through that, but we have barley, wheat, oat, and interestingly, potatoes to the base of the terrace fill, and that's interesting. Also, not much richness variation down terrace, but definitely some variation between the cultivated and non-cultivated profiles in terms of the richness. So we have sheep, cattle, goat, and horse, but only horse in a couple of samples. And so we also can see that we have fewer animal sequences in the, in the uncultivated profiles. Uh, but we also have quite a lot of worms in all the profiles, including those which are actually uncultivated, but they are very close together. So, and we'll come back to this. This site is really useful because it's it's um it's a site which was owned by Nidaros Cathedral, and so it's included in a in a survey in the fifteenth uh, century, and then we have a really good records from it from then on, and the two charcoal dates which are almost identical fall into this period here, and you can see that's what we have in the DNA and in the written records we have sheep, horse, cattle, barley, and potatoes. This is one of the sites, and we now think that the terraces were constructed because of what was called the, pot the potato priests who moved north from Nidaros Cathedral to basically convert the northern Norwegians into growing potatoes in the 1740s and 1750s. And we think this is what actually led to the construction of this site. The second site is the other end of the transect, which is in Castronovo, uh, a series of terraces with water channels, um, around the castle and, uh, of Castro Novo. Uh, and at the moment, our construct, our terraces, the, the terrace that we looked at, particularly in great detail, um, is dated to the 12th century, but it may be a bit earlier than that. And I'll, I'll probably explain why in a minute. Uh, here, uh, 216 sequences, uh, all the red ones in that, lit, that, in that column there are uh, ones we found on site last year when we did a, a botanic survey so but we found 15 percent of them actually on the site today but the rest not we have really good cultivars uh, we have all the cultivars that you would expect from sicily um, fig and walnut and um, uh, pomegranate and and etc vitis of um, vine of course but we also have medical plants we have nitrogen fixing plants and we also have late introduced species and that's important because that gives us a check on our chronology so this is the section um a cartoon of it and you'll see that the bottom two contexts here there is no prickly pear but there is prickly pear there and this fill was uh, is, is 17th century because the wall fell down and had to be rebuilt. So we knew that that fill was later and this is later. So that gives us some confidence that these lower two contexts here, which have all these cultivars in them, are before the date of the introduction, of course, of the prickly pear, which dates the earliest it can be, is really um, uh, 16th century, early 16th century. Um, and we also get, for example, tomato appearing at the top, but not in any of the lower ones. So it makes some sense. And that's one of the hairy things about DNA is that you can you can you can really check things against uh, sort of known introduction records. The 
uh, animals are not particularly interesting. They're the, the normal um, uh, domesticates. Interesting up, there's no um, no chicken in the lowest context, and, and we, we we don't actually have any, an explanation for that. The other thing that's interesting is that because this is these most of these go to species level, we can be very precise, um, and we've got this this list here, including things like the white mulberry and licorice is very interesting <laughs> licorice it was brought back to europe by the uh, by the crusaders from this area uh, the arabian pea was also of eastern mediterranean origin this is a very interesting group of, of of cultivars and they look very much like an islamic norman hybrid assemblage so the question is could this this these terraces really be a bit older than this but this relates to the problems dating problems at the moment we're doing high pi dating to try to see whether that's the case the other thing is that of course um why is it so good well it's so good because it has this is uh, just x-ray diffraction and you can see the shoulder here those two there and there you can see the shoulder there and at that wavelength that is swelling clays so this site has uh, smectite and uh so we have smectite and then we also have apatite, calcareous clays, and we have illites as well. And basically, uh, we think that this is sort of this mixture is just fantastic at holding, holding DNA. And this, um, the smectites are particularly interesting because this is what's called nano confinement, whereby we think that the DNA can actually enter the structure of the clay. Uh, uh, as, and as it enters the structure of the clay, it becomes protected and therefore it's retained particularly well. And this is obviously of, of great potential interest for um, means that SEDA DNA, one of the reasons SEDA DNA will work outside what we would otherwise think of its, of its climatic range. Now I want to end really by just sort of looking at whether we can sort of link our catchment at the moment. I've either talked about lakes or I've talked a bit about the terraces, which are all slopes, of course, really. Um, uh, storage is on slopes. And this is a very good diagram from Charlene, um, sort of puts <laughs> what I'm trying to say is can we link the processes on these slopes um, through the river system uh, into, into what's happening in the lake? And of course, can we relate that to uh, accelerating human impact um, in the Anthropocene? So let's let's look at um, let's go to a site. This was a site that we neglected. Um, it was a little pond, really, a small lake that we caught years ago on the way to Scotland, just really to practice. Um, I was interested in it because it had a it had a, a bizarre thing called a lowland hill fort um, right next to the lake and a very small catchment. But we um, we had it in the core store for um, many years um, and only really looked at it uh, about um, three years ago, two, three years ago. Uh, and it um, was turned out to be a bit surprising. So we have over 250 plant taxa, but we have 32 animals, uh, excluding the worms. Um, uh, and I'll say a bit more about that. Um, and But we have things like walnut and cannabis and hemp and flax and oats and wheats and barley and peas and corn marigold. Uh, and then in the medieval and post-medieval, we have things that we again would see um, um, uh, as uh, introductions. Uh, well, beet isn't. Beet, beet probably has is, is been around before. but um, And so it is these these uh, cultivars, and it is a remarkable. Um, there's buckwheat, for example, there is hop. You know. um, if you look at this range of, of, of cultivars, uh, the site has to, be, um, has to be owned by someone of some importance to be able to, to grow. This is not an average assemblage for the Roman and post-Roman period. Uh, or, uh, and so what we th suspected from this is that it might have something to do with uh, with a monastery or with monks. There is no monastery there. Anyway, so um, that's that's the plants. But then it also has, I mentioned 32, I think, uh, um, um, animals. Now, um, we are supposed to get mammals because the two primers we use are designed for mammals um, so we do we get the domesticates and we get a cow and a sheep and uh, red deer um, a pig goat uh, and we get a bit of horse and horse again is interesting because it always indicates an elite or uh, um, sort of wealthy owners if you like um, uh, but 
Um, uh, we also get beaver. And here's the beaver record. It's the yellow here. And you can see that it's there until somewhere around about the end of the Iron Age. And then basically it disappears. And pretty well, um, maybe it's probably into the into the Romano-British period. The dating is very fine on this, and this is our major problem, is the dating, actually. But basically, when the beaver disappears, the fish appear. So you can see this expansion of these fish. So that's um, eel and perch and the cyprinids. Um, sorry, that, that's, uh, that's uh, pike uh, and uh, bream. So this is just a bit sort of suspicious really um uh, it looks like it went basically from being a, a beaver pond to being well putting this together you'd think it was basically a domesticated domestic pond it was a stock pond and again uh, the most likely cause of this is probably something to do with the church and we do know that this site was actually in the there's a in this parish uh, lands were given to the first bishop of uh, Shrewsbury Abbey, a man called Fulcred of Seas. And what we are suspecting now is that, in fact, this may have been where um, he established effectively a, a, an estate. So it is actually a bishop's estate. At the moment, we can't prove that, but that's what we think is, is likely, because otherwise it's extremely difficult to explain. There is another explanation, but I'm going to, <laughs> going to ignore that <laughs> uh, historically. Um, but um, uh, that's what we think is most likely. But we're still not putting the catchment and the lake really together here. But I think if we move on to the worms, then we start to do that. Now, we shouldn't really have worms, but uh, because it's a mammal primer and worms are clearly not mammals, but because there's so much mammal DNA, we get a lot of what's called bycatch and the, mat and the, the, the worms dominate the bycatch. So um, now, um, if you're into your worm, eco worm ecology, you'll know that there are these different categories of worms. Some feed at the very surface of litter and at the surface of the soil, some a bit deeper, and then some quite a lot deeper, the deeply burrowing earthworms. And if we look, these are the species there, and we've got 11 of the 28 accepted earthworm species in the UK. And actually, the ones we don't have are all rather rare. So we've got most of the common ones, as you would see you if by these names. But if we start to group them and we look at how they come out over time, it's very interesting. Because first we have the leaf litter earthworms. Well, they're coming out all the way through. I mean, they, they're there all, all through our record from the uh, Bronze Age um, coming out into the lake. But later we get the end endogeic worms from somewhere around about the Iron Age. They start to appear and these the sort of shallowing shallow burrowing, burrowing earthworms. And then in the, uh, uh, around about a thousand years ago, we, we get the, um, the appearance of these deep burrowing earthworms, the uh, anisic worms as they're called. And when you look at that period, when they appear, that's around about a thousand years ago. And what happened then? Well, the most obvious thing is that that's the period of introduction of the heavy plow to the British lowlands. Uh, and this, of course, allowed much more cultivation of actually very fertile playlands. So what we are, our working hypothesis is that this is really what we're seeing is the introduction of the heavy plow and that this is therefore causing soil erosion from greater depths within the soils, the few fields that there are that are contributing uh, to this lake. Right, so that's, I think, starting to, to, to link our catchment to, to, to our lake. And that's, that's where we want, want to go. And so um, we I basically come to the conclusions now. Um, so um, I think these are the sort of things, the places I think we can go uh, with this work and partly where we are. Um, this diagram up here is how we can possibly relate some of the things I've talked to together, um, how we can relate them together. So we've got human presence from fecal stanols. We've got um, human presence, uh, um, ID um, at least, well, and, and other mammals, of course, um, through gut, the gut microbiome. 
And we also have an indication of status here because we have, um, for example, horse, that's the horse sequence there. And so you can sort of put either I put a, a crown over a gut here because I think you're starting to to see the the a bit about the actual types of and what people were and who they were um, uh, through this kind of data. So the high tax stamp resolution and multi-organism um, e ecosystem reconstruction, basically, we can start, I think, from lakes to look at diet and health diseases. We can look at um, uh, biotic and abiotic drivers. Uh, and of course, it, I think uh, people are working now on looking at the microbial dynamics um, within lakes. Um, in relation to human impact. I think obviously I've shown some combination of, of DNA with other biomarkers, but one of the points, the reason we started doing this was to sort of triangulate our, our DNA really, to try to get our proxies sort of to work together so that we've got a, because if you triangulate your proxies, you've got a, a, a stronger inference. So the inference can be stronger, maybe more specific as well. And then the last thing I think, um, which I hadn't talked about much, but we've got a paper at the moment that we've just published on how we're going to do this, um, which is basically testing various ecological models of, uh, of um, lakes and catchments um, using this kind of data. So, um, and I think with that, I think that's, that's, um, that's, that's it. Oh, last thing. Um, this is some of the team. That's that's the Southampton team. That's a part of the Southampton team, and now dispersed a bit. And that's the the Arkeco Gin team up in the frozen north. Uh, and I'll take this opportunity to advertise that we're running uh, next year the second international set of DNA, second international DNA conference up here in Tromso. So this is this will be your your opportunity to come to the to the to the. Uh, uh, to the very north, and we'll be running a couple of field trips uh, as well up in the from Tromso as part of this uh, of this um, meeting. So uh, that's a blatant advert uh, advertisement there. So.